Welcome back this evening to our second night, May 28th, 2022, of our music conference at Briam Baptist Church. And we're again glad to have you here with us. I hope that most of you got to stay, uh, come early and join us for dinner. And I want to thank those who did the cooking and um, all of the slaving over the hot grills. And I appreciate your work. And I wanted to also ask you at this time if you would take your cell phones and turn the sound off or turn the cell phones off just so there's no interruptions during our meeting tonight. We'll be starting out as we did last night with one hymn, and then Brother Ives will be coming and, and starting out with the first message. Then we'll have one hymn intermission, and then Brother Randall will come. And um, we're going to just start with a, with a word of prayer. So let's go ahead and bow our heads together to the Lord. Father, thank you so much for the gift of music. Thank you that you have put a song in our heart that keeps us often as a song in the night to you. Thank you that we can make melody in our hearts to you and that we can teach and admonish one another and that we can grow spiritually. I pray that you'd help us tonight, that the teaching would be clear, that the word of God would be effective in its delivery and that we would have open hearts to receive the Bible truths that you have for us. Thank you so much for Brother Alan Ives and his coming and for Brother John Randall. We pray that you would use them tonight as your instruments. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. All right, Brother Randall. Take your handle through 628. We'll sing My Savior's Love, 628. Let's stand. We'll sing the first and last verses. Last night, you know, we looked at some folks that uh, belonged to the tri tribe of Israel and were worshiping God, but they were imposters. They uh, were really serving their flesh, and God would not accept their worship. And, and uh, then we looked at a few other things with Brother Randall's message. Tonight, uh, we're going to end up in Amos chapter 5, Amos chapter 6, and Matthew 5 or 6. And uh, just for beginners, uh, I'm going to have us turn to Jeremiah chapter 10. Our music in this world has uh, become a pattern for a lot of churches. The churches have adopted the music of this world for the worship of God, but our God is a holy, holy, holy God. And uh, I want us to look, and let's stand together. I think you just sat down, but uh, let's stand together and read the word of God together in Jeremiah chapter 10, and we'll get to Amos, but Jeremiah chapter 10, right at the beginning of the chapter, and we're going to read uh, down just through the first phrase in verse 3, Jeremiah 10, verses 1 through 3. Three and just the beginning of the verse. And then we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll get to Amos. But let's read together. Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen, 
And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. And we can stop right there. For our purposes tonight, it's what we're going to look at is uh, the difference between what a heathen does in his worship, in his praise, in his life, and what a Christian does in his worship and praise and prayer and life. They're not the same. They might be called parallel, but they're not the same. Some might think it's similar, but they're not the same. So let's pray, and then we'll go to Amos chapter 5. We're told what? Learn not the way of the heathen. We don't want to do that with our music either. So let's pray. Dear Father, bless this message now tonight. And uh, preachers have already prayed. And Lord, folks have come. They're expecting to hear from heaven and from thee. And so let that be so. Help me to this message. And uh, Lord, guide it where... Uh, where I might not, and I have just exactly the right word to say and uh, make it, Lord, be an honor to thee and a help to the people here tonight. Don't let them be disappointed. Just speak to them through thy word tonight. We'll praise thee for that. And Lord, we know that it, will, it may be wonderful things for the life that will heed thee saying, so bless now in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated then. And this is not particularly a salvation message, although salvation in the Lord is, is always what makes the difference. And we'll see that between the heathen and the Christian. But in Amos chapter 5, and I still have to get there, it's not on. think it is. No, now it is. All right. That's as close as me and electronics ever get. If it were up to me, we would still be inventing wheels, folks, so you should be glad for others that have uh, some real talents and abilities. But uh, Amos chapter 5. And I get there. There we go. That's why they call him a minor prophet. He's buried underground somewhere. Amos chapter 5. Amos chapter 5. God is speaking here uh, to the children of Israel. And it says in verse 23 of chapter 5. Take thou away from me the noise of of thy songs. Well, that's a strange thing for God to tell anybody, don't you think? He says, take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials. Those are violins with frets like a mandolin or a guitar, by the way. That's what vials are. We, we don't see them much anymore today, but they're in the violin family. And most violinists despise instruments with frets on them. But uh, that's their loss. That's, that's their loss. Whatever we do, looking at just this little bit of the verses here, God speaking to disobedient Israel, we don't want our songs to be ignored by God. You know, David's psalms were oftentimes his prayers, weren't they? And oftentimes we pray when we sing our songs. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There, a precious fountain. And we sing songs like David's prayers. We want to be sure God hears them and answers them. But Israel had put themselves in a place where God would not hear the songs that they sang. Their prayers, 
that were voiced with music went unheard by the Lord. He refused to hear them. We want to look in chapter 6 of Amos and see what was going on with the children of Israel. And I'm just going to begin with verse 1 and we'll read down through verse 5 or 6. Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. These are people living in luxury. There's nothing wrong with being rich. If you know that it's God that giveth thee the power to get wealth, and then you use the wealth you have to be a blessing to others and to honor God, perhaps to support missions and missionaries and so forth. But here the children of Israel were living high on the hog, although they didn't eat, the, you know, they, we know they didn't eat the pigs, but... <laughs> And trust in the mountain of Samaria instead of the Lord, I guess, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. God has pronounced woe to his own children because their trust was no longer in God. Pass ye unto Calne and see, and from thence go ye to Hamath the great. Then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms, or their border greater than your border? The Lord said, take a look at the nations around you. Are they doing better than you? Are they blessed more than you? And of course the answer was no. God had blessed his own people far above the rest of them around about. And he was pleading with them. Verse 3, ye that put away the evil day and caused the seat of violence to come near. What were they doing there? They were saying everything's okay and everything was not okay. They were pretending that they were right with God and all was right with the world and it wasn't so. They said there's no trouble coming. Certainly we're not in trouble with God, but they were. And God said, you're causing the seat of violence to come near. I don't know if I can exactly explain that, but I don't need violence coming near me, and you don't need violence coming your way. And I don't know how it particularly would come if it came, but I know I don't want it. And the Lord said that their attitude was bringing that violence near, that violence upon them. Look at verse 4. That lie upon beds of ivory and stretch themselves upon their couches and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall. Now we found out what they're eating. We knew it wasn't the pigs. But... And then it says, that chant, that chant to the sound of the vial and invent to themselves instruments of music like David. They weren't the same. I think of another verse, their rock is not our rock. They're different. But it looked like instruments of David. It looked like God's praise. Verse 6 goes on, and we'll come back to that chanting business in just a minute. That drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the chief ointments. But they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. There was trouble in their land. There's always trouble in a land somewhere. All of us are sinners. That makes a lot of trouble. Well, folks, we're the cause of the trouble. Sinners. Someone always said, you will have a good day. We'd all have a good day if it weren't for other sinners. Sometimes, the other, sometimes it's ourselves. But here we find these people chanting. That's not the same as praising God. And if we were going anywhere, when we speak of learning not the way of the heathen, the heathen chant to the sound of the vial. God's people praise him. 
And so that's where we're going, and that's what we're looking at. But with all the trouble round about them, it didn't grieve them at all. You know what? Even as God's people, we can get to the place where the sin around us does not grieve us. It ought to trouble us. Sin in us, sin around us. They weren't grieved for the affliction of their own people in their own land. Their sins and their troubles and their problems. And they went on carrying on just like everything was okay. And as we said before, it was not. These are the people to whom God pronounced that he would not hear their songs or the melody of their vials. And uh, we can say, praise the Lord, at least they still had a melody. We got, we got a lot of stuff around us today that doesn't even have a tune anymore. And that business of chanting has something to do with that. We, we know the word in, in, in very many senses. Uh, for instance, a, a big long name for a rooster is a chanticleer. Uh, it's a chanting bird, you know, crowing in the morning. I, we met some crazy birds. They, were, they crowed all day and all night. They didn't seem to know, you know, when to wake us up. It was just a never-ending barrage, but a, a, a repetitious noise from a rooster. If you're a sailor, you sing a sea shanty, a chant. If you're French, you sing a chanson. It's a chant. If you're Jewish, you have a cantor singing to you. And sometimes chanting is singing, but other times it's not. Song of Solomon is sometimes called the canticles. Again, that word chant is hidden away in there. We sing in, in uh, the song, May Jesus Christ Be Praised, Be This While Life Is Mine, My Canticle Divine, May Jesus Christ Be Praised. It's a song. Uh, cheerleading. Cheerleading is a good example of chanting, you know. And when we were in high school, they used to start us out, the whole crowd at a ball game, you know. We're from Oshkosh, couldn't be prouder. If you can't hear us, we'll yell a little louder. We're from Oshkosh, couldn't be prouder. And it just built up and built up until we were all hoarse. I had to learn not to scream at the ball games. You don't sing very good after that. <clears throat> Somebody said you didn't sing very good before the ball game. <laughs> but at least I have an excuse then. There was some, some song that right in the middle of it. It was a stupid pop song back in the 60s, you know. And the music, what there was of it all stopped. And everybody on the record was singing boom, shakalaka, leka, boom, shakalaka, leka. But repetition, repetition, chanting. You know, the people in the East have mantras and ragas. The ragas are religious melodies that go on and on, but their mantra is their chant. It's their holy words by which they carry out their worship to these various false gods. And they chant. It's not very long, and I have no idea. I've never heard anyone's mantra. It may be just a sentence or two. And it has something to do with the direction their life ought to go or what they're all about or who they are or what they're asking from their God. Nevertheless, they have a mantra. And they repeat these words. They're like magic words. I remember when we watched Walt Disney as kids, you know, that... The witches were brewing something and they were singing Salagadula, Menchikabula, Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo. Put it together and what do you got? Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo. And it, nonsense words. It was just a chant. Do you know if 
we translate that into music, and you say, well, this, this has to do with their religion. Well, music has to do with everybody's religion, too. When you get a song that's built on a repetitious rhythm, I'll tell you what, we, we had a song in the 60s. It was called Land of a Thousand Dances. And it went something like this. Land of a Thousand Dances in one chord. Repetition. Repetition. And do you know, we found out later on, and they tried to sell it and package it that way, there were a hundred songs written on one chord. One hundred one-chord songs. You don't, you don't even have to learn three chords. You got to do that much to play kumbaya around the fire. One chord. What, what were they doing to us as kids back in the 60s? You're supposed to gasp. You couldn't possibly be that old, Brother Ives. <laughs> they were giving to us something really different than what we heard in our churches. They were giving to us a music that didn't care if there was an incessant repetition of any kind. And you heard the lyrics of that last song. They're, they're deep, aren't they? And they repeated just as much. And the rest of the song named, it didn't name all 10,000 dances, but it, it named as many dances in three minutes as they could. With this repetitious chant and repetitious rhythm and repetitious chord, there was no other melody than what you just heard. There were no other chords. That was, like I said, a, a one chord song. We think of Elvis Presley only because of the message, but a very popular, uh, if I don't rip the uh, microphone off here, a very popular thing. And uh, kids don't even know the names of rhythms. Rhythms have names. But back in Elvis Presley day, that was a very popular uh, bass line to a lot of songs. And it, it went with a rock and roll rumba. But a... Same rhythm. Same series of notes on three chords. This one has more than the other one had, you know. <clears throat> but again, uh, it's something that in, in, less than, in less than six months, kids could pick up on these songs and learn them and have a band going after a year. They were very simple. They were very repetitive. But... Um, We're going to turn to the, to the Old Testament here in just a little bit. And I believe it's 2 Kings, 1 Kings 18. 1 Kings 18, and I'll say just a few more things. We, we get used to chants. I think it was in the Wizard of Oz, you know, they're on their way to the Emerald City and they were afraid, so they began to sing, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, lions and tigers and bears, oh my. And that went on for uh, the length of their journey, a good length of it anyway. Thinking of some more, more things about this business of repetitious chanting. Um, people wondered about rap music when it first came out. Now nobody bats an eyelash, an earlash at it, I guess it would be. Nobody seems to mind it, but they took away all the melody and they just spoke the words to a very rhythmic song. And folks get used to it and they like it. There's chanting. 
Someone said, what's wrong with rap music? I said, we're told to make melody. The song is supposed to have a tune. Something you can sing or whistle or hum or repeat on an instrument. Making melody in your heart to the Lord. I, th I think of one 19-year-old Jewish boy over in Israel, and he thought that the Messiah should come. He's right. The Lord's coming back. And so he said, we need to help the Lord come back. So he began to trance dance. Why the name? I think if you watched it long enough or listened to it long enough, it would put you in a trance. The steps were not hard. They didn't need to call Arthur Murray or anybody else. And the boy just jumped up and down. And when he got excited, then he hit his fist. You didn't know I was so fit in this society, did you? But uh, he did this for hours. That repetition, just moving his body, jumping up and down. There were no other steps. And pounding his fist when he was particularly excited. Repetition has a whole lot to do with the heathen and their chanting, the heathen and their form of worship, the heathen and their false gods. And so we're going to look at, we're going to look at this imitation prayer, imitation praise, imitation worship, if we can call it that, in 1 Corinthians 18. And as usual, I got to get there and catch up with you. 1 Kings 18. And we want to look at the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Verse 22, and I'll skip some of the verses here, but, but uh, 21, verse 21. Of 1 Kings 18, it says... And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. By the way, that's wonderful advice. If the Lord is God, you must know him first and then follow him. And by the way, we don't imitate. Christians, we do not imitate Christ. We follow him. There's a difference. Satan is transformed into an, an angel of light. And uh, imitating the Lord and following the Lord are two different things. But if Baal, then follow him. So Elijah said, look, if, if Baal's God, then follow him. Whatever your religion is, you ought to believe it enough to follow your God. And the people answered him not a word. That's a tough one. Then Elijah said unto the people, then said Elijah unto the people, I own, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. So he's obviously saying one of them is, and one of them isn't God. And all the people answered and said, it is well spoken, and it was. And Elijah said unto the prophets, in verse 25, prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call in the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning, that's 6 a.m. if you're Jewish, even until noon. And we do the math and say, they're doing this for six hours 
360 minutes. And what did they do? Saying, O Baal, hear us. Ah, okay, that's part of verse 1. What comes after that? O Baal, hear us. Well, is there more? Yeah. O Baal, hear us. For six hours. A little bit repetitious. You know, if I said, okay, let's eat supper together. 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 Some will say, let's eat already. <laughs> After you hear it a couple times, that's enough, isn't it? And there's a reason for that, and we'll get to that. And, of course, vain, vain repetition will break every rule about repeating things like that. So they spent six hours saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. They're getting a little more serious now. So he, he jump on the altar here. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking or he is pursuing or he is in a jury, a journey or peradventure. He sleepeth and must be awaked. So what's the matter? He's just, he's not hearing you, I guess. And they cried aloud. Oh, they're getting serious now. We really, really, really mean it, Baal. And cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed out upon them. Some religion. They're fanatics, all right. And it came to pass when midday was past. They prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. Now they're going to 6 p.m., another six hours. And there was neither voice nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. Now there's something really weird about heathen. They thought for some reason if they just showed how earnest they were. Oh, Baal, here is, oh, Baal, here is for 12 hours. Surely, fire would come down and consume the sacrifice and nothing happened. Whatever hand the devil had in it, God wouldn't let him do a thing. Verse 30, and Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me, and all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran round about the altar. And he filled the trench also with water. He wanted to make sure if God brought down fire from heaven, that they would know it was God because he, he doused them and soaked them so that nothing should have lit. And by the way, I want to tell you something else. I first learned about this passage because when I came to church, pretty much all I knew was rock and roll and a few old Methodist hymns. And an older man, an older gentleman in the church, his name was Nelson Hayes. And he was up in years and he said, look at this story. He said, when Elijah built an altar to the Lord, he didn't use any of the stones that the prophets of Baal used. He said, we don't borrow 
from Baal. His things. He said, Elijah built an altar to God of better things. And he was warning me as a young, and he saw what was in me. And as a young kid, he was saying, we don't want to borrow Baal's music. We don't want to borrow Baal's chanting when we come and praise the Lord here at church as born-again Christians. And I knew what he was saying. I didn't know I'd ever pre preach it someday. But let me finish the story. In verse 36, and it, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, now watch his prayer. And I'll, I'll, I'll guarantee you it didn't last for 12 hours. It didn't last for six hours. Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me. Similar, they said, O Baal, hear us. He said, Lord, hear me. That this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is the God. They fell on their faces. That's a picture of worship, isn't it? He said, he's the real God. Elijah's God. And we can read the rest of it. They took care of the prophets of Baal. They were phonies. They are worshiping Baal, and Baal couldn't help them. Elijah spoke a prayer that lasted less than a minute. And God heard him. The ears of the Lord are open unto our prayers as believers. We don't need to pray a long prayer. Do you know what my favorite prayer is? I'm 72 now and I've faced so many things that I don't have the answer for. And you probably have too. But my favorite prayer, and I found it in the Bible. Help, Lord. That's short. But God knows what I mean when I pray it. And God's ears are open unto my prayers. And God answers when I say help. It doesn't need to last 12 hours. Because as a, as a child of God, as a saint, I have a living, breathing relationship with the Lord himself. He's the living God, and I'm a lively stone, and I belong unto him. I walk with my God day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour. And I'm no good, but the Lord has made it so that we can confess our sins and stay in fellowship with him. But it's not some God that's far off, and I have to go, oh, God. Are you there? Oh, God, are you there? That, that might, have, might as well have been the, the Baalite priest prayer. They couldn't seem to find him anywhere. <laughs> Baal, I mean. And so... we are able to communicate with the Lord. And it doesn't take forever. We are very unlike the heathen. We learn that we don't have to. We don't have to stay up all night and not eat for 40 days and 40 nights. 
for our God to hear us. And I know there may be a situation where somebody needs to do that somewhere, sometime. But the Lord's ears are always open under our prayers. If we wake in the middle of the night, we can speak to him then. If we're busy working and we cannot even stop from work, we can still speak to the Lord and he hears us. If we're right in the middle of trouble and problems, we can cry out to God and he hears us and answers our prayers and often speedily. We don't need to work up into some kind of lather to show God that we really mean business. It's not necessary to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And how many times would you want me to say that? We reach, we reach a point, even when we're dealing with people, if they tell us things too many times, we just shut the ears off. It's an offense. When somebody says something too many times, we go, I'm listening. Don't, you don't need to say it again. Or we say what? I heard you the first time. I want to make sure I don't miss anything. But let's turn to the New Testament. We, we, there's some things we need to see further. The heathen are making a show to a God they don't know and trying to put some effort into it, hoping that somehow that will awaken this thing that they are calling God. When we pray, a prayer of any length, and the Lord hears us. Very, very different. And I want to try and tie this in with music and with worship and with our life. So we go to Matthew chapter 6 and we'll start with verse 5. Now we're in the New Testament. Someone said it was better because it was newer. But anyway, it is a better testament. The Lord said so. But And when thou prayest, it says in verse 5, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. He's calling the heathen hypocrites. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now notice the hypocrites are not praying for God to hear them. They're simply praying to impress people. So they, they need a long prayer because they got to stand out there for a long time and they want somebody to see them on this, this little habit that they have of saying prayers. They're religious, all right, but it's an imitation of what a real Christian does. And the Lord says they have the reward. People look at them and go, oh, they're so godly. They're so holy. That's the reward. Men think, oh, they're really something over there. But thou... Us, Christians, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. He said you don't need to pray in front of anybody. You, you, you ever, <laughs> you're at a noisy table, not our, not our family at our house. But uh, you had a noisy table and everybody's going, shh, 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 shh. And they'll do that sometimes. I'll just start praying and, and, they'll, and they'll go, shh, shh, I go, you know what? God still hears me, whether you're listening or not. So he tells us to pray, and that's part of our communion with our, our Lord. But when you pray, look at verse 7. Use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. There it is. That's the characteristic of a heathen. 
They think somehow it's the, it's the volume or the amount or the time they spend begging their God for whatever that will make God listen to them. And I don't really know that God listens to anybody's prayers until they say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. But once we're his, and he is our heavenly father, as I said, his ears are open unto our prayers. He expects us to pray. We honor our Lord when we call upon him because we know that no one else can bring the answer but our, the, our Lord himself. And he wants us to acknowledge that too. So he tells us, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. And you see, when it comes to music and when it comes to life, the heathen like that repetition. That pounding. It is the way they think of their religion. They pray and they pray memorized prayers. We went to a Catholic funeral for a relative of my wife's. And we got there a few minutes late. That seemed to be my way for many years. But we got there late, and Susan was just a little girl then. And I suppose three or four years old. And we got into the foyer, and they could hear the whole congregation our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And that's how they pray. They drone. They chant. And Susan looked up at me and she said, Daddy, those people don't know how to pray. And I said, that's why we're not at their church. Now those are our relatives trying to call on God like that. Oh, and they, they can get they can get my wife abbreviated them all. They learned glory bees, Hail Marys, and our fathers. And each one of those is a, is a longer prayer. My wife can still recite them. But uh, here's a Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Now, that's just one Hail Mary. But if you want to pray the rosary with those beads around your neck, you, you have to do five sections of ten Hail Marys. And you say those words over and over again. And first of all, Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners. She's not going to do it. Okay? It's not going to avail anything. Oh, Mary, hear us. Oh, Mary, hear us. Oh, Mary, hear us. This isn't going to work. Here's a glory be. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost. I agree with that. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. I agree with it, but I don't turn it into a memorized chant. And who knows how many glory bees you've got to pray before the rosary is done. I don't have, a, have it written down. And, of course, you know, the, the, our Father is what some people call the Lord's Prayer, and it was just a, a, a sample prayer a, or a model prayer for the disciples who said to the Lord, Lord, teach us how to pray. And this kind of thing goes on. And they have no surety they have no surety that when they call upon God over the body of this dead person at the funeral, that God is going to hear them. 
If they do happen to quote a verse like John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life, it gives them no joy. It gives them no assurance because their tradition has made the word of God of none effect. It doesn't mean that the Bible is powerless. It means that it does nothing for them because they're believing the tradition and so that makes the verse in the Bible meaningless. And this is a sad condition of the heathen. They chant and hope that God will hear them. The assurance only comes from the Bible. If we want to hear from God, we need to read his book. If we expect to hear from God, it's his word that we need to read. And some of the churches forbid their people to read it. Some of them don't encourage it at all. Some of them print versions different than our King James Bible. And then verse 8 says this in Matthew 6. Be ye not therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And then he he did uh, put his prayer here for them. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Good prayer, good prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Right after telling them not to use vain repetitions and what do the heathen do? They take this prayer and turn it into a memorized chant that means nothing to them. Do you think that they are believing the way they live? They're asking God not to lead them into temptation. If they prayed that, we wouldn't have a tavern in our cities. Deliver us from evil. Crime rate should go down. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Oh, yeah? Do you think they're praying that? Lord, let me behave myself as everyone would perfectly in heaven with no sin. They're not even thinking about it. I need to tell you this, and I don't want to use up any of Brother John's time here. But it uh, seems like I always go longer than I expect to. I talked to, uh, we, we had, how many Catholic churches in our city? Six or seven. But we had a lot of Catholic friends, just lots of them. And uh, I'm not picking on them. I just, you know, talk to a lot of them and I know what they think and what they believe and what they don't believe and what they don't think. There was a gal named Mary and she worked in a restaurant with me. And uh, I talked to her often about needing the Lord. And she would say, you know what? I get tired of you're all the time saying Baptist stuff. And so I prayed and I said, Lord, I, what do I do? What do I do? And I thought of one of those Catholic prayers that they pray. They chant it, but they pray it. And, and it goes like this. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, Have mercy on us or have mercy on me. And I thought, okay, she knows this prayer. It's only that long. And I went to her and I said, you know, I know a Catholic prayer. You accuse me of only saying Baptist things, so I'm going to give you some Catholic things. And I said, here it is. I said, do you know this? Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. She looked up and said, yes, I know that. I said, now I got another question for you. Do you know what it means? She 
He said, no. Do you know why you pray it? No. And I said, there's just three parts to it. Let me break it down for you. And I said, Lamb of God, who is that? I said, that's Jesus. Why is he called the Lamb of God? I don't know. I said, he's the Lamb of God because he laid down his life as a sacrifice for my sin and your sin. I said, if every Catholic thought about this prayer and prayed it, they'd all go to heaven. But I said, Jesus is the Lamb of God. I said, then it says, who taketh away the sin of the world? I said, do you know what that's all about? Not really. I said, uh, well, let me ask you this. If he took away or takes away all the sins of the world, did he take away my sins? Well, yes. I said, how about your sins? Did he die to take away your sins? Well, well yes. I said, that's what that's all about. He's the sacrifice of God who was sacrificed to take away my sins and your sins and everybody else's. Doesn't mean everybody believes on him, but that's what he did. So she's nodding her head. And I said, why do you pray or say, have mercy on me? I don't know. And I said, when you realize what an awful sinner you are. You recognize that Jesus is the only one who can save you and you know you need his mercy so you don't suffer his judgment or his wrath. Lunch was over and we had to go back to work. And I said there, you got, you got something Catholic. Now, I didn't tell her that it was John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. But nevertheless, I gave her that little bit of scripture cloaked in Catholicism, I guess. And four days later, she saw me again and she said, I did it. She said, I called on the Lord. I put my trust in him. What we had to do was take that chant and take away the vain repetition and turn it into something that she had to think about. Something that dealt with a living God that she had to deal with while she was still alive. And of course, I have other things to say, and we're not, we're not going to get there. But let, let me just say this. The heathen like the repetition. When, they, when it comes to their music, they like it just to play and make all this noise, and they don't think about it. They're not thinking about the words. They're not thinking about how it affects them. They're not thinking about it, what it does to them or the people around them or why it's even in this world and why it exists. But they like that beat that just goes on and on. It matches their life. You know, they go to work. Do you know why there's always so many problems? And you got to call people up and check up on their work because they, they charge you the wrong amount or they didn't, they didn't run the card right or this happened or that happened and more and more that's going on. They're not thinking about their work. They're not going to work thinking about how can I be a good worker and, and make this a successful business for my boss. They like being an automatic. They can't wait for the day to end and thank God it's Friday. They can't wait to get out. And if they crank up the music, music they call it, that keeps you from thinking, and boy does it ever, that suits them just fine. It gets them through the day faster. But it is not their way to live their life thinking every moment, every step. You know, 1-800, one, one, how am I doing, Lord? They're not thinking that way. They're just going through life. They're letting life happen. 
without knowing what's coming. They're not thinking about eternity. They're not thinking about death. You try to talk to them about death, and they tell you they don't want to, they don't want to discuss it. They like being in the chant mode. That's why they like the music. They turn that stuff up. You know some of them do. You get to the street corner and they've got those drums pounding so loud, you think you turned it on in your own car. You know, it's just, and they just use it to drown out everything and not think. We need to to be at a place where the music in our life is music that helps us think about God and what he's done. To think about our life and our relationship to the Lord. To think about what the Bible says. To to discern what is right and what is wrong. To gauge our steps and say, Lord, is this this the right step according to the Bible? Is this a, a, a right turn according to the Bible? And by the way, when it comes to repetition, I'm just going to throw this out to you. You read in the Bible in 2 Samuel 18, David mourning for his son. He said, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God I had died for thee, oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Three times he said Absalom, my son. In Jeremiah 22 and verse 29, we hear, oh, earth, earth earth, hear the word of the Lord. In Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 3 in Revelation 4, 8, we find the beings there in heaven crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That when it comes to repetition, after you do three things three times, that's enough. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. And I'm not being facetious about that. My my composition teacher says, after you play a little melody, I'll just do that, and then we're done. And I I don't necessarily have a conclusion except to say, if, if you don't have a living, breathing, walking relationship with the Lord, the Lord of life, you need to have that. And and we need to exercise that as born-again Christians that that know the Lord. And every moment of the day, we can stay in fellowship with the Lord and talk to Him, run everything by Him. But if I, I play a little tune, here's the second time, third time, My composition teacher says, you've got to change it after that. And I said, why? And he said, well, that's just the rule. He didn't have an answer. But he knew this. If you wanted to make decent music for thoughtful people, or thoughtful music for decent people, whichever it is, you didn't want it to be too repetitious. You didn't want it to sound like the pop music of this world. You don't want it to be idiotic music. And I said, the only answer I can find is in the Bible because God is a trinity. Three is is the, the number of times you repeat something and then you must change it. And we all react to it. I'm just going to say this. If I say, for God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, For God so loved the world, we're okay. But now if I go on, for God so loved the world, 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 it becomes irritating. If it didn't, then, well, you got problems in another way. And and that's the way the music of this world is. The drummer, you know. You have to be an idiot to listen to that and enjoy it. And that goes on for six minutes or ten minutes, or depending on how long the song is, with very little variation. That doesn't help us to think. It puts us into the trance dance. It puts us into a hypnotic state. They said if they could play rock and roll music for 28 
minutes and some odd seconds without ending that they would totally captivate someone who would listen to this stuff that long. And it all has to do with, with chanting instead of praise. When I gotta be done. I gotta be done. When we praise the Lord with with every breath, our heart is lifted up to the Savior. Every thought we dwell on, and then we take those songs home on Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Well, we, we may have a midweek service too, but but it's because we have this relationship with the Lord. And we love to think on his name and we love to praise him and we love to pray unto him. But it's, but it's all very real. It's not some deadpan chanting to a God that we don't know. Living a life that way too. They're dead in trespasses and sin, walking through this life without a thought of God, some of them. Anyway, I'm just going, going to close here. Dear Father, thank you for what we've looked at. Help us not to have a life that's run in automatic. Help us, Lord, to have a life that with every breath we do praise thee. Lord, that we stay in communion with thee. That we're thinking on thee. We're thinking on thy word. We're heeding thy word. We're listening every moment to the Spirit's call, as the one song says. Help us rejoice in that. Help us let others know they can know thee and have this same living, breathing, moment by moment, walking with thee. A real God in a real relationship. Thou knowest us by name and we know thee. We thank thee for it. Bless in the things that Brother Randall brings to us yet. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to do how many churches were, had to do for many, many years. We're just going to sing 455 acapella, 455, my Jesus, I love thee. Let's stand 455. My Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine, for thee I be seated. This is uh, 
actually a new tune to an old hymn. It was so much like the old hymn, I'm not too high to do it, I have a melody for it. And it was so much like the old hymn that it took me time to figure out that it was a different tune. But uh, the text is a poem entitled Jesus, I am resting, resting. It's directed right to the Lord. It's a prayer to the Lord. And uh, it's a wonderful thing to rest in the Lord. We're told in the scriptures that when we come to know the Lord, we enter into his rest. We see people everywhere struggling with God's salvation, struggling with their salvation. We just need to rest in what Jesus has already done. He died for us. He paid the price, shedding his blood for the remission of our sins that we might know that we have eternal life. And so, uh, with the Lord's help here, and a little help from the microphone, I guess, you know. We'll sing this, Jesus, I am resting, resting. I am resting, resting in the joy of who thou art. I am finding out the greatness of thy loving heart. Thou hast bid me gaze upon thee and thy beauty.
Take your Bibles and turn to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. Will this have enough battery to get us through, Brother Reese? Okay. Galatians chapter 1. Last night we talked about our music having the right motive. And according to the schedule, we were supposed to be talking tonight about the music having the right message. And then on um, tomorrow, we're going to talk about how music having the right messengers. I was planning on combining the two messages and messengers and moving on to methods tomorrow night because we're going to alliterate everything. But uh, we'll just see how much we're going to get through tonight because it's really hard to separate these two concepts, the right messages and the right messengers. So let's take a look at Galatians chapter 1 and verse... Six. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. It's been 20 some odd years. I, I probably, I think... This took place in 2001, 2000, 2001. I was um, involved in a, a decent-sized church while I was in college, and we were having a, a summer camp meeting. And what that translates into is they went out and set up a big tent in the front yard of the church and moved the services from the auditorium out to under the tent. And which really is just not as much comfortable because you don't have air conditioning, you have bugs biting you and all these kinds of things. But their idea was we're changing the atmosphere to have revival. And uh, I was um, rooming at the time, because when I was in college, I was rooming with the dean of students' son, who was a troubled young man. And, um, and I say that because he would do things to get me into trouble. And I never will forget because I was talking with a pastor of the church. And for camp meeting, camp meeting not only meant they were going to move everything outside, it meant that music's going to be a little different too. Normally we would have piano and organ just like a regular church service, but we had special musicians there for the week. And uh, we had all kinds of extra instruments. Now any of you who may have known me for any length of time, there are certain instruments I am not fond of. And... Um, one of those happens to be, and please, if you like it, that is fine. You'll still go to heaven. <laughs> but um, I I'm just not a big fan of the banjo. Now, I know that's horrible things to say in the South, that you're not a fan of the banjo. It's just not my thing, okay? Maybe yours, that's fine. There's nothing sinful about the banjo. But um, my friend knew that I disliked the banjo, and there was a, the group of singers that were singing that week. They had everything on the platform. They had uh, dobros, they had guitars, they had banjos, they had all these various instruments. And I had cracked a joke to my friend. Um, I haven't hesitated to use that word friend. Um, <laughs> this person that was my roommate. I cracked a joke a few weeks before, and I said to him, a joke, and so we were standing there, we were talking to the pastor and some people in the church, and Anthony said, tell pastor that joke you told me. And I knew as soon as he said, this is not a good idea. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, no, no. I tried to pass it off, and, and um, the pastor said, well, what was the joke? I knew better. I said, no, never mind, it was nothing, don't worry about it. And he kept pushing it, and Anthony, tell him a joke, John, tell him a joke, fine. And I said, I said, you know what the definition of perfect pitch is? And the pastor said to me, no, what is it? I said, it's the sound of a banjo hitting the bottom of a dumpster. 
And you would have thought that I would have doused it with kerosene and flicked a match. I mean, he went just crazy on me. And I'm standing there like this, and Anthony's behind him. <laughs> and he made a statement, and it's always stuck with me, because he, he made a statement. He said, you know, because he was very upset because he thought I was criticizing the meeting and the music of the meeting and so on. He said, this is the music that will bring revival. And I thought to myself, okay, well, and, and I was only a 19, 20-year-old man, young man at the time. I'm still trying to figure out life out and, and figure out exactly where I stand with everything. And I thought to myself, well, okay, let's try it. Let's see if this meeting, this church, experiences true revival. And within a year, that church had went completely into nuclear meltdown mode. I sit on the, in some of the business meetings, I mean, where I mean, people were storming out the back doors. It just was bad. And I remember sitting in one of those business meetings thinking, well, this is not revival. <laughs> because music is not what brings about revival. That's not the way it works. It may bring about an emotional experience. I remember sitting in that set of meetings. I was one of the two pianists in, this, in, the, in the meetings. And the, um, we would have 45-minute to hour-long invitations. And there was the two of us that would rotate on and off playing music the entire time. You haven't lived as a pianist until you've played I Have Decided to Follow Jesus 32 times in a row. <laughs> Talk about repetition. And I saw all kinds of emotional experiences. I saw plenty of emotion. I saw tears. But we did not see revival. Because it's not synonymous. It's not how it works. And the reason I said all that to say this, because last night we talked about having the right motive with our music. It doesn't bring revival. Tonight we're going to talk about having the right message. We still haven't got down into the musical parts of it yet. Well, what is the message that we're going to be presenting with a song? What does the text say? What does the word say? And where does it all come from? And the Apostle Paul said to the Galatians, he was talking about doctrine. He said, if anybody preaches you any other gospel, he's to be accursed. But yet here we are taking all kinds of musicians and songs that teach other doctrines and we sing them in our churches. We've been doing it for years. Just the other day I was in, um, I was in a church in Florida helping with their um, uh, or with a Christian School Association in Florida and the, and the church that hosted the event, they had a new hymnal. And this new hymnal is put out by um, a church in California, North Valley Baptist Church and Publications. It also hosts a college, uh, Golden State Baptist College. And they have a new hymnal that's been put out and edited. And I, I, I had some downtime, and I sat, and I looked through the hymnal. And it has uh, around 650 songs. And I, I started taking notes, and I lost the paper, unfortunately. But I got to over 100 songs that is in that hymnal, and I was only probably halfway through. And over 100 songs that are from charismatic Pentecostal sources. They're not Baptist. It was, it's songs and hymns of revival. And most of the songs have been written in the last 75 years by people. One of the most popular songwriters in that hymnal that they used over and over was Lanny Wolf, who doesn't even believe in the Trinity. He believes... It, there's only one. It's the Jesus only movement is what they call themselves. Well, how, is, how are we supposed to get our doctrine from someone who does not even believe in the same doctrine we are, but yet our churches are singing their music? See, Isaac Watts, we talked a little bit about this last night. You know, Isaac Watts had some new concepts to when he came along, started writing hymns. And he put together an entire hymnal to teach children doctrine. 
One of those songs we sing all the time today, I Sing the Mighty Power of God. Do you know that was written for third and fourth graders? Eight stanzas. That's a little bit different than the song we learned last night, Potato Chip, Potato Chip, isn't it? <laughs> because he believed we teach the children doctrine. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. No, we don't take their songs and sing them. We mark them and we avoid them. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. Ephesians 5, 11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 5, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth. Now those are some pretty strong words, and if you, I could put some names to that. Some songwriters of today, they're destitute of the truth. And that's why we looked at this passage of Scripture last night, and I told you, do mark it in your Bible, because we're going to be coming back again. Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. What's it say there? It says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In other words, your songs should be full of Bible. They should be full of doctrine. What kinds of messages are we teaching with our songs? Who is teaching the congregation with our songs? Two years ago... Um, we began praying about moving to Tennessee. And we looked online and we found this church in White House and we decided to just to randomly show up. And we sit on the very back row. We, we slipped in five minutes and my wife and I had this discussion as we were coming here. Because we talked about moving, we're going to find a church. And we sit on the back row and we just sang hymns. There were no specials. There was no choir members. And I was very disappointed not because I was looking for a show, but because I found out years ago that I can usually find out what direction a church is going by what kind of music they're doing. And there were no specials that morning, so we had to find out by other ways what, what this church was all about. But you will find a lot of interesting things. You can tell a direction of a church by the kind of music that they do. And the kind of music they do is a revelation of the heart. It's showing a temperature, what's going on in a person's heart. And what a church is comfortably, music-wise, will tell you what they're comfortable with in their own personal life. If you're totally comfortable with a church singing little ditties that have no scriptural content whatsoever, chances are you're totally comfortable with having very little scriptural influence in your life. And what is being taught behind the pulpit in the song? I'm fairly certain that every single person in this room would be very, very uncomfortable if the smiling preacher, Joel Osteen, was to show up and preach in this church. I dare say, I don't know that anybody would hang around. And I can mention several others. But yet... We're totally comfortable in a lot of churches with having false teachers promote their doctrines and their beliefs through their music. And this has been going on for a long time. And I want to touch on a few things. And, and I, I want us to think about it. There, now there's going to be some, some, some things I'm going to bring up. And I, I want you to just consider it, okay? Some of them are in the hymnal in your hymnal, right here in the pews. And we just, because oftentimes we just get up and we sing and we don't think a thing about what we're doing. This is something that has, I, I was talking with um, uh, somebody just last night after the service. 
my musical journey has been just that. It's been a journey. In the early days, there are some people that I was totally comfortable with, and I like their music. Bill and Gloria Gaither, I, they could write some great tunes. And I was totally comfortable with their music. Uh, growing up, we did a lot of, of music in our church that I, be, I wouldn't do now. Let's just put it that way. Um, so I, when, I, when I approach a song, when I think about it, what, what is a song teaching us? And that said, historically speaking, there have, been, there have been a lot of controversies over the years. People say to me, well, it's okay to sing this song because we sing songs by Fanny Crosby and she was a Methodist. Or we sing songs um, by uh, Martin Luther and he was a Lutheran. <laughs> or my favorite, it's okay to do this kind of music because this fable, and I say it's a fable, has been told over and over, well, Luther used bar tunes. So it's okay for us to use rock and roll music because Luther used bar tunes. Well, that, well actually, no, he did not. That's a lie. Uh, he used folk tunes. There's a whole different thing between bar tunes and folk tunes. Folk tunes of his days were common tunes. Happy Birthday is a folk tune. They may sing it in the bar down the street when someone has a birthday, but we can still sing it here on a Sunday morning when someone hits 92, and it's no different. There's a different thing between using folk tunes and bar tunes. We say, well, Martin Luther did. Well, this is true. This is true. However, the differences of musical style is a whole different world today than it was in Martin Luther's time. And that's a whole discussion we'll t maybe, maybe touch on tomorrow if I can get into the history of it all. There has been many disagreements of them. There have been some songs that have been written by certain people that have passed down through time because they're valid. They're good songs, good text, good words. The author was in a great place or, or in a spiritual walk at the time, but people change. I could, I could take, take you to a number of songs in the hymnal, and I'm not going to do it, because there are certain songs in the hymnal that you will know and you will love, and they are great songs. And when that songwriter wrote them, they were walking with the Lord. But at the end of their life, they weren't walking with the Lord. Some great songs that you may know, and I'm not going to ruin it for you. Because people said that to me, why do you have to ruin everything? Well, I want to try not to, I want to try to ruin as little as possible. But Fanny Crosby, Fanny Crosby wrote over 4,000 songs. We don't sing them all because not every single one of them are good songs. Some of them are, and not, not necessarily wrong, they're just, they're just not that, that great of quality. But what kind of messages and what kind of messengers are we dealing with? What's the song teaching us? If we look through our hymnal, you can find a number of songs in there that have just kind of been passed down through tradition, and we sing them just because, well, that's just the way things go. One of the songs that happens all the time, and I hear it in churches all the time, is Battle Hymn of the Republic which has zero spiritual value. And I say zero spiritual value because Elizabeth Ward Howe was a uh, feminist woman who hated her husband and didn't even believe in God. But yet we have Battle Hymn of the Republic. And people sing it at, at the uh, patriotic times, and a lot of people probably will sing it tomorrow. And if you ever go into a church and they're singing Battle Hymn of the Republic, don't stand up and walk out. Bless God, we don't do that here. <laughs> I brought that up to Pastor last year, and, and we went down to the camp on uh, 4th of July, and they did it three times that day. And every time they did it, everybody around me went, <laughs> because John doesn't like the Battle Hymn of the Republic. But when we're having a song service, as a congregation, we need to think about this. What is the message of this song? One of the songs that we sing, and, I, and I, sometimes you, you will find, uh, 
Dr. Johnson has mentioned it, and various other people have mentioned it. They say when you, when you play the instrument, you look just bored. Well, it's because sometimes I'm bored, um, usually on the organ, because there's just not a whole lot going on there. And, but my mind tends to wander, and I think about what we're doing. And one of the songs that I you, just became very bothered at a, year, a couple years ago was, because, what is this even teaching us? Was burdens are lifted at Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. You say, well, what's wrong with that song? Days are filled with sorrow and care. Hearts are own lonely and drear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. Burdens lifted at Calvary, Jesus is very near. You repeat that phrase 27 times. First praise and worship song is what I call it. And the reason I say that is because what does this mean? What, why are we repeating? And each verse starts out with life's just rough. But burdens are lifted at Calvary, Calvary, Calvary. But it wasn't this kind of concept who didn't come about until the last, I mentioned last night, to the middle of revivals and, or, or the certain revival meetings in the middle part of the late uh, 1800s when all of a sudden we're just teaching songs to get people to react to something. And that's when we stopped teaching doctrine. We'd st and that's a great concept. Yes, burdens are lifted at Calvary. But there's a lot more to it than that. In the south, I grew up um, in the mountains over on the other side of Cookville. And so growing up, we grew up singing a lot of sentimental songs. And, and even as a kid, I'm like, what are, where, where are the roses never fading in the Bible? And that's a very popular funeral song. I'm going to a city where the roses never fade. Where's that in the Bible? Or we would sing a song called, Just a Little Talk with Jesus Makes It Right. And I'm sitting there going, what's a fire wheel? Because in the chorus it talks about, uh, no little fire is burning and, and have a little fire wheel turn. That's, that is Buddhist theology. I found that out as an adult. <laughs> uh, the whole concept of spinning your little fire wheels, but till, let's just little talk with Jesus makes it right. And right after a little talk with Jesus, we sing sweet hour of prayer. Why? We're not thinking about what we're singing. But yet along came the Jesus movement in the 60s and the 70s and started doing contemporary Christian songs. And we're criticizing them for their re repetitions and their, their little ditties and their empty phrases and their empty songs. And, well, you've been doing it for years. Because we're not singing songs that are letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly. There's a lot uh, songs about heaven. I look forward to heaven. But you should be very careful with songs that begin with these two phrases, imagine or I dreamed. Because usually they're followed up by a lot of things that are not right here. There's a, there was a very popular song back in the 70s and the 80s. I think it was, maybe it came around in the 80s and the nine, early 90s. It was on every single missionary presentation that missionaries would come through and they'd play the song in the background. And the song started out with, I dreamed it went to heaven and you were there with me. We walked along streets of gold beside the crystal sea. We heard the angels singing and then you called my name. And the whole song is, thank you for giving to the Lord. Do you really think that when you get to heaven that there are going to be random strangers coming to you? Thank you for putting your five cents in the plate so that, so that I could be saved over in Africa. Do you think you're, that's what we're going to be doing in heaven? There was another song written called Faces. My father-in-law and I were talking about this the other day. I, it, and it's all about the same concept. When I get to heaven, I'll look at all the people that I brought there with me. No, you won't. When we get to heaven, there's only going to be one thing that's going to be the center, and it won't be you. All of these songs are me-centered. They're not Christ-centered. They're not God-centered. When we get to heaven, 
we don't know a whole lot about what's going to be there. The Revelation gives us some description. There's some description in the Old Testament. But there's no reference whatsoever that we're going to be standing around patting each other on the back for the things that we did. It's not going to be there. So why do we sing about it? Back in the 70s and the 80s, when contemporary Christian music was really, really picking up steam, there was a song that was written, I think it was around 1968, and by a man who's considered to be the father of contemporary Christian music. His name was Larry Norman. And Larry Norman wrote a song called, Why Should the Devil have all the good music. And the whole concept of the song was pretty much that we can take the good music and put Christian words to it and make it even better. But it had the same concept of why is it all the heathen have all the fun and we don't? It's the same idea. What do you mean? Why does the devil have all the good music? The devil doesn't have any good music. There's no such thing. The devil doesn't have any good anything. So if you actually think that this music, I, I really think that he was revealing something very interesting about how he looked at the music. So you're telling me this music comes from the devil? Is that, is that what the idea? But that's what Larry Norman wrote. It's a really, I, I would highly discourage you from looking it up. It's a hideous song. Um, because to be really honest, the devil did have the music and there wasn't anything good about it at all. In the early part of, uh, as music began to progress through the, through the, uh, the, the co contemporary Christian artists, and there have been some songs that, that did have some decent text. They are few and far between. And we'll deal with some of them tomorrow night. But through this time period, there was a huge flippancy to how people addressed God. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah, let's go there. Isaiah chapter 6, in the, ki ki the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and His train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims, each one had six wings, with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me. For I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people with unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. It's a little bit different attitude than another very, very popular song that came about. I was going to look it up here because I was going to read a few lyrics. And I was going to write them into my notes, but it didn't hit me until I got here. This song is sung in a lot, of, a lot of choruses with young people. You may know the chorus. And Rich Mullins wrote it, a popular CCM artist. The chorus goes like this. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. With wisdom, power, and love, our God is an awesome God. Very popular Chorus. How many of you heard the chorus, Our God is an Awesome God? How many of you heard the verse? When he rolls up his sleeve, he ain't just putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. There's thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden, and it wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. What do you mean? 
when he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't putting on the Ritz. And I could read you the next few verses too, and it's just as flippant. There is not one single attitude about who God is, because what is Isaiah doing? He's on his face. And his very first remark is, Woe is me, for I am undone. Our God is not, as one musician put it, your homeboy. That's not the way it works. And every single instance when mankind comes face to face with the presence of God, he has one reaction. He's on his face on the ground. Yet we have such a flippant attitude. And so we wonder why the young people in our generation are leaving the churches be and, and trying to find a more religious experience because God isn't there. As time has went on, in the early part, our church is mostly rejected in the early days much of what was coming on as Christian rock and roll. But there were some exceptions. One particular couple I mentioned a few minutes ago was Bill and Gloria Gaither. And we started singing the, the Gaither's music. But Bill and Gloria Gaither, are, um, they belong to Church of God in Anderson, Indiana. They're both graduates of, of, of the college there. They have written a few numbers that I would say, that's, that, you know, the words are good, the tune is good, but they've written a whole slew of numbers where their doctrine is just plain off. They don't believe in the same doctrine that we believe in. They do, they, they do uh, 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 concerts, ecumenical concerts with uh, Catholic uh, uh, priests and Catholic ministers there. Uh, they do not believe in the same uh, prophetic doctrines that we believe in. Uh, they have a completely different belief on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit because they're Pentecostals, the Charismatics. Another composer that I, I've heard his songs in, and I don't know how many fundamental Baptist churches, a man by the name of Jack Hayford. Jack Hayford wrote a song called Majesty, Worship His Majesty. Majesty, worship His Majesty. And yet the song talks about kingdom authority. And kingdom authority has to do with latter rain theology where in the last days we're going to be able to pick up serpents and heal people. Because Jack Hayford, who pastors the Four Square Pentecostal Church, doesn't believe in the same theology. But yet we have Baptist churches ever talking about kingdom authority. Dottie Rambo believed in oneness theology. Her, her and Lanny Wolf. Who, who wrote a number of, of popular songs that, that our churches sing, didn't believe in the Trinity. Andre Crouch, he wrote a song called My Tribute. How can I say thanks for the things you have done for me? And then the chorus, to God be the glory. And if you actually, uh, just a side note, uh, I, I noticed one day I heard the song and I was like, wait a minute. And I went over and looked at the piece of music and I was like, well, the first verse is, is identical to um, Frank Sinatra's My Way. It's the exact same tune, if you look it up. But um, it worked for both of them. I don't think there was any copyright claims for either one. But uh, uh, you have Andre Crouch. He's called the father of modern gospel music. All of them have these titles, you know. And, um, but Andre Crouch had significant doctrinal uh, uh, issues. You find that he, uh, I, I, looking through his songs and looking through some of the statements he made, I don't even know if the man is saved. But one of the songs he wrote called, uh, The Blood Will Never Lose Its Power. The title's great. The words to the song talks about how the blood that gives me strength from day to day will never lose its power. That's not what the blood does. But everybody sings Andre Crouch's songs, but he also collaborated with Madonna and Michael Jackson and Stevie Wonder and Elton John, and you can keep on going and going. And that's why I could sit over here, and, and I, I, I'm not, but I could uh, play some of Andre Crouch's numbers and cross them over, and you'll find the stylistics. I can cross over every single phrase with Elton John's style songs because it's the exact same style music. 
It's, it's, it's a pop style. Rodney Griffin. You say, who is this? Rodney Griffin. He wrote a song. I, I used, to, when, I, when I worked at a college in, in New York for a while, I was, it was Southern gospel music that I was fighting on a, on a very frequent basis. And I asked him, I said, why are we doing Rodney Griffin numbers? And Rodney Griffin has won multiple uh, awards in the Southern gospel music industry. But he writes these songs. He wrote the song, by the way, I mentioned earlier, called Faces. Um, and uh, he also wrote a song called My Name is Lazarus. And I heard this done by um, uh, um, at least two, if I could, maybe even three independent fundamental Baptist colleges. The song, My Name is Lazarus. And I said, well, that's really interesting because the, the song, My Name is Lazarus, the, it's a story song. And the story goes like this. Uh, you know the four men that brought uh, the, uh, the uh, lame man to Jesus? Well, um, as they were dragging him up on top of the roof, they were all having a conversation. This is all set to song. Um, and the first one says, you know, I was a, a, a blind person, and, but, and Jesus healed me, but I don't think he can, he can heal. This is a tough case. And the second person, well, uh, my, uh, uh, I was a um, uh, lame person, and, and Jesus came, and it was all these different miracles that Jesus had healed. And the, and, but uh, this is a tough case. I don't think Jesus can do this one. And the fourth one comes along, and, and it, this is when you do a dramatic key change so that everybody stands up and waves their Bible. Um, so... <laughs> The fourth one comes along, and, well, the last course, well, my name's Lazarus, and let me testify, you know, Jesus rose from the, raised me from the dead, so of course he can do everything. Well, that's really clever, and that's a cute song and everything, but the problem is that Jesus healed that man before Lazarus died. So the whole premise of the song doesn't work. Because, why? Because we're not really looking into the Bible to find out if the, 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 the text of the song actually is doctrinally correct. Jaron Davis wrote a song. He actually wrote a lot of songs. I, I, I will say that I probably saw 20 or 30 in that hymn I mentioned earlier uh, that, uh, that, that he had written. Um, wrote a song, um, Holy Ground. And I, I hear the song, We Are Standing on Holy Ground. It was interesting that that pastor that I mentioned earlier that said this is the kind of music can bring out revival. He wanted me to do a song. He wanted me to do Holy Ground. And we were parting ways at that point in time. <laughs> it's interesting. If you look at the text of these songs, you will look at it and say, there's nothing wrong with this text. And I will look at it and I'll say, you're, you're probably right. There's probably nothing wrong with this text. And the priest down the street can look at it and say, yeah, I don't see anything wrong with this text. Fine text. And the Presbyterian church over here is going to look at it and say, this is fine too. Because all of the music, all of the songs have to cross denominational barriers to be able to be sold and to be able to be passed. It's got to uh, uh, pass congregational barriers. Here's an interesting quote from Christianity Today. John Steele, who is heavily involved in the music industry, said you can have some pretty straight-faced but theological liberal Presbyterian church using the same songs that are being sung at a wild and crazy charismatic church, but they use different arrangements and adapt the songs to their unique settings. Don Main of Integrity Music, and these are people who promote this stuff. They're not people like me and you. They're people who promote this stuff. He said, I've discovered that worship music today is transdenominational, it's transcultural, it bridges any denomination." Twenty years ago, there were so many huge divisions between denominations. Today, I think the walls are coming down. In any concert that I do, I will have 30 to 50 different kinds of churches represented. Well, how are you going to be able to present strong doctrine if you have 50 different doctrinal representations in their audience? That's why... Back in the 70s, when they began to do these huge rock concerts that involved all these different artists, they were specifically told certain words not to use. Words like blood. Words that would be 
controversial or certain phrases in certain doctrines like the Trinity. So, doctrines that you and I take strongly, they were just say, put it out, leave it out. And that's why I mentioned that the song a few minutes ago, Holy Ground. Barbara Streisand was at a funeral and heard the, word, the song Holy Ground and she thought it was really cool. And so she decided to record it. It's on one of Barbara Streisand's recordings because she said, it shows me that God is just in everything and everywhere. And Barbara Streisand does not claim to be a born-again Christian. But she can take a look at that song and just say, yeah, I can do that. Why? Because it's not really saying a whole lot. There's a, several places I could go, but it's, it's late. So let me end with, with, with these three. There are three very popular companies today that you will find their music everywhere. You will find their music in independent Baptist churches, Presbyterian churches, Methodist churches, non-denominational churches. You will find it everywhere you go. You go. I've heard it sung by, uh, I've heard s uh, songs by these companies. I've heard them in independent Baptist colleges, such as West Coast Baptist College. I've heard it in various uh, uh, quote-unquote independent Baptist churches where they say, we're just going to fix these up. And the three companies are Hillsong, Elevation, and Bethel. Now, you may know one of those three, you may two of those three, or three of those three. Um, the first one, Elevation, is, uh, a, is a, a mega church. It's pastored by a man by the name of Stephen Furtick. And Stephen Furtick has multiple campuses, and uh, Elevation Music, I would say, is the least controversial of the three. Uh, but uh, Elevation, the, the, the church there, has been heavily influenced by uh, charismatic and Pentecostal theology. Even though Stephen Furtick, his background is, believe it or not, Baptist. But he's, he's had, uh, he mingles in different circles, and, and he's had T.D. Jakes uh, preach, and he's preached along with T.D. Jakes, who again, they don't even believe in the Trinity. They believe God is in all of us. Following Jesus, and I quote here, doesn't change you into something. It reveals who you've been all along, which is really against the idea of, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. But elevation music would be the, I, I would say, the, the least known of the three. The top two are really Hillsong and Bethel. Bethel music is, is out of Bethel Church in California. Uh, Bethel teaches some really interesting things. Just a couple months ago, I had a friend say, send me, and I don't know why people do this to me. Um, I try not to be controversial. I really do. Uh, but the, I think they're the trying to say, you know, well, this song is okay, right, John? And you don't say anything, and they're like, right, John? Don't poke the bear, okay? <laughs> and he sent, me, he sent me a song, and it was done by Jen Johnson, whose father launched Bethel Church, and it was a song called The Goodness of God. And Jim Johnson is standing up there on the platform, I will sing of the goodness of God. And she's crooning along in a bartender kind of voice kind of way. And I looked at the words, and the words are just fluff. You know, I will say, yes, God has been good, and God's been got me through all these trials and everything. But Jim Johnson's not going to write anything that's going to be any... Anything strong doctrine. You know why I, why I say that? Because there was a conference where Jen Johnson was talking to a whole bunch of ladies. And she said, she said, I'll, I'll quote so that I get it exactly right. Um, so my God, God, God to me, Jesus to me, and the Holy Spirit to me is like, like the genie in Aladdin. That's who he is to me. He's funny, he's sneaky, he's silly, he's wonderful. He's like the wind. He's all around. When you use the term sneaky, is that a compliment? No. <laughs> she also went, and I'm, I'm not going to quote this one exactly, but she also was talking about heaven. Again, I, I warned you when people start talking about heaven, be careful. What she thinks... 
the angels are doing in heaven. She said, she said I, I think the angels are chatting around the throne room of heaven, and they're cracking jokes. And she said, I think, and I'm going to abbreviate my own, and you can fill it in, in your imagination. She said, I, I think they're cracking jokes that have to deal with bodily functions. I actually do know what the angels are doing in heaven. They're saying, holy, holy, holy. They're not cracking jokes. But this is the kind of composers that's writing the music. She's one of the big name writers for Bethel music. Bethel teaches and practices all kinds of charismatic heresies such as the continuations of the apostles and prophets. In other words, what we, uh, they're, they're around today. Tongues, healing, angelic and demonic sightings, clairvoyance, grave soaking, where they lay down on the ground on a grave to soak up the deceased person's anointing. The appearance of glory clouds, gold dust, angel feathers, and even raising the dead. But I can name you multiple Baptist churches that use Bethel music. Is Bethel music going to have music that is letting the word of Christ dwell in us richly? Bill Johnson, who's the pastor there, made this statement. He said, he claims that without signs and wonders and miracles, you won't have the true gospel. He made another statement like that was, did you know that Jesus was born again. He had to be born again because he became sin, is what Bill Johnson says. Again, with this kind of mindset on who God is and who Jesus is, they're not going to be writing songs. So when Jen Johnson is singing about the goodness of God, is she singing about her genie? What God is she singing about? Because it's not the same one I worship. Hillsong. Hillsong's been in the news a lot lately. And I, I, I will. Uh, um, oh, one other statement about Bethel uh, that I miss here. At every service, our worship team ushers us into the presence of God. Is that the purpose of music? No, no, it isn't. What about, what about Hillsong? Hillsong um, has, has, has written a whole slew of popular songs um, that have, have, have pretty much any church that's using the praise and worship music um, is going to be using a Hillsong number. One of the most popular ones was Shout to the Lord. Another one was Mighty to Save. Darlene Check, who is the founder of Hillsong music. And by the way, the New York Times reported that Hillsong's music is without a doubt the most influential producers of worship music in Christendom. When asked why his church, Bill Houston, who pastors Hillsong, when asked it was why it was so successful, Bill Houston said, we're scratching people where they're itching. Which I find a fantastic statement considering the fact that the Apostle Paul warns about that exact thing. <laughs> Teachers having itching ears. But that's what Brian Houston said. And I'll, I'll, I'll close here with, with a few quotes by Darlene Check, who, who started Hillsong. They asked her what she envisioned in the future of the contemporary worship music, and she said, I had this vision a few years ago of how God saw the worshipers and worship leaders linked arm in arm, the production personnel and everyone that is involved in the worship of God. It was how I imagined God's heart for what we are doing. We're all in line. We're all slow. But we're all walking around, and we weren't leaving anyone behind. We're taking everyone with us. In other words, unity. She went on to say, I've been in the Catholic Church in the United Church, the Anglican Church, and many other churches. And when worship is offered in truth, this sound emerges regardless of the style. It is the sound of the human heart connecting with its maker. 
none of the churches she mentions even know Christ. She went on to say, in her song, or I'm sorry, one of her books, she uh, discussed, and I'm skipping, I have, about, I have about two pages of quotes here, but we're going to skip down. She was talking about uh, a popular rock artist, you may have heard of him, called Sting. I watched Sting in concert. He was absolutely incredible. So much gift for one humankind. Thoughts raced through my head. My goodness, Sting, you're like King David, full of psalms, melodies, and music, and you sing as if you don't even know that his hand is upon you. If you know anything about Sting, which I hope you don't, he's not anywhere, anywhere close to where Christianity is. He's not King David. When a person has these kinds of, of ideas, that, that unity and togetherness is, is the most important result, then you will give up everything, because you have to, to have unity in oneness, if that is the goal. Our goal and, and, and I have to close here because it's very late. But our goal is to have music that is honoring and glorifying to God. It is to have the word of Christ dwelling in us richly. And if a person is offended by that, that's not our business. We are, our business is to stand for Christ and to present the gospel and let the chips fall where they may. It's not to bring about unity. It's not to make money. It's not to not offend. The gospel's offensive. When you present a person with a gospel and tell them, you are a sinner, that's offensive. Our music is to be different. I was, I was in an office when I was getting ready to step down from the music director of a college and a church and a ministry. And the pastor said to me, when a lost person walks through that door, I want the music of our church to make them feel comfortable. And I said to him, then I'm not your man. Because our music as Christians will never make a lost person feel comfortable. That's what we said last night in Psalms chapter 40. Many shall see it and feel comfortable. No. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. That's what our music is to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to look at the music that we're singing. Help us to examine it, help us to be conscientious, help us to pray about it, and more than anything, help us to have the music that you want us to have. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Pastor. I believe the Lord ordered the services tonight. It was excellent to go from the contrast in chanting to thoughtful and, under, and singing with understanding to go to this practical application in the world today of what you have is a mindless dumbing down of doctrine, dumbing it down to fit in anywhere, as well as singing with not understanding, you know, it's um, there are a lot of things, and I think some of this would probably be good for us to go back and listen to again, so we will have it, Lord willing, on our website, so you should be able to go to briambaptistn.com and be able to listen to it or watch it again later if our streaming Held up. God bless. Good night.